my dad told me that, oh, you're going on an adventure. I left when I was seven. It's a small little town outside the old capital, Saigon, which the southerners still called Saigon instead of Ho Chi Minh City. And it was very Catholic-led, actually. My dad, my mum, my sister and brother. It was just us. We were surrounded, you know, the, my aunties and grandparents lived down the road. My sister was always the tougher one. I remember one instant, uh, one child was trying to take a sweet from the shop. I was too scared to tell my parents and my sister watched out for her and the next time she did it, my sister ran out and caught her red-handed. At Easter, they had a life-size statue of Jesus and he was almost in a, a little coffin, but he was lying on a bed of popcorn. So he had to you know, kneel down and kiss his feet. I'm sure I must have picked one or two popcorn. <laughs> In this mid-autumn festival, at night time, all the children would go out in a procession to church and you had these amazing paper lanterns and then you put a little candle on it. Some of them weren't that well made and the candle would get knocked over, the lantern would go in flame. But their nice memory was actually selecting a coloured lantern of an animal and that was lovely. My uncle was sent to a concentration camp, but in my mind he had gone somewhere and he just didn't return and we were told that he died there uh, and I always remember the night that he died there was a giant moth-like butterfly thing and all the family would say oh that's that's him returning and we never spoke about him much again. I remember one time we had a, a kind of an outdoor toilet and I always remembered my dad's political portrait and he always hid it on the ceiling above the toilet. I always wondered, why did he not just put it up on the wall? I think one day police came on a search and I remember thinking, please don't let them look up there. My whole family, we had tried to escape a few times, but after a couple of goes, you run out of money there were only enough to get two tickets for my dad and one other. And I think he chose me because I wasn't as streetwise as my sister. <laughs> and health-wise, I was probably a little bit weaker and they thought I would, would not survive in Vietnam. I don't know why they think I would survive on the boat, but... <laughs> I was very frightened because I remember so we had to wade in the water surrounded by reeds, literally just my head above the water, waiting to board and get the signal to come on board the ship that would take us out to sea. We had to keep very, very still because we were aware of other patrol boats. And I just remembered there were about 50 of us crammed into this tiny boat. Even as a seven-year-old, it looked very, very small and you could touch the water with your hand. And yet everyone was kind of sort of lying side by side, no room to move. You just felt really, really small in this big ocean. The boat was rocking back and forth, filling up with water. I remember everyone sort of shouting. Suddenly it was like this iceberg coming towards you with multi-coloured fairy lights. To be honest, I thought I was dreaming because I was asleep and my dad woke me up and said, look, there's a ship. It was enormous, a sort of British army ship. It was so big compared to our boat. I remember looking up and not even seeing the railings. Consequently, I found that we had run out of food um, virtually uh, sort of a couple of days before. Um, so. A pure coincidence we came across the ship um, and you felt the hunger but still felt energised seeing the ship. One of the first things they did was throw down some food, cream crackers and green apples because they were the biggest apples I've ever seen. And we stayed very close to the side of the British ship even though we never had permission or were never allowed on board in the first few days. But we knew that our safety 
meant that we had to stay next to this ship no matter what um, with the fleets of pirates um, in the horizon. They only let the women and children on board first after a few days of being beside us and then the storm was getting worse and worse and then finally they let the men go on. A couple of days later there was another Vietnamese boat hoping to get on the British boat as well but because they had got our boat already they couldn't take another boat on and I always remember we were told by the British ship to stay quiet as well not look out of the windows and I actually did do a sneak peek and I, again I could see pirates in horizon. I don't think they were planning to get to anywhere just to escape from Vietnam and we'll get to another country. We weren't on the, the ship for that long, actually. They dropped us off in a camp in Singapore and then we stayed there for a good few months until we could go on to Britain. my house um, that I shared with my dad and other members of staff. With all these uh, neighbouring houses, um, there were other Vietnamese staff who lived here. So we had a little community with us. It wasn't, as far as I was aware of, a military camp then. There might have been um, in one section of the island, but I never felt any military presence. Look, this is a great one off that of the build, our building. Wow. It was very significant because it was the main building that I remembered, not only because of its physical structure and its beauty, because um, the architecture was very different from Vietnam, but it also represented a community because the Vietnamese refugee community stayed here, uh, lived here, ate here, and had functions and festivals in here. I think when now when you hear, when you see a few scenes of the camp in, in Europe or camps in Calais, uh, it did seem very different. And I think that welcome makes such a big difference to how yeah, a person, never mind a child, perceives their new country. In ex-army camp, they had lots of outside wild space, so I would actually be on my bike and I would ride everywhere without supervision. And respite was like old runways, big expanse of concrete, wildflowers, wild grass, and I always remember that, and just that total freedom of just riding around. I think I had probably a bit more freedom because my dad, he was a university professor in Vietnam as well, so he could speak English quite well, so he ended up in a translator in the camp. There were only three of us who were chosen to go to school outside the camp. Everyone else was educated in the camp. People didn't treat me any differently um, um, from memory at all in this school. You were just a, a, another pupil. And the headmaster, Mr Thomas, uh, was amazing. But you knew you were different from the other children anyway, not just because of your look or where you came from. Um, your place of living is different um, and you had to go past a barrier to get onto the camp. In my mind, it was just a stage in life that um, we were going through. It wasn't the end, it was just somewhere in the middle. Quite big contrast when I got to Hackney, actually. It's kind of nitty gritty, urban, you were just one of the number of immigrants in the school and the children weren't nice to you. They didn't all want to be your friends, so it was much tougher. After that one week in a Hackney school, my dad moved me to a Catholic school and I was very happy there. I was very good at art. That was my comfort as well. I could sit there for hours drawing.
We actually lived in a council flat in Hackney. Interior was fine because you decorate it how you want and it was quite homely. But it's, I think it says exterior, brown, dark. Even then I think I knew the stigma of, of what it was like living in a council flat because that was quite a strong feeling of not wanting to have birthday parties in the flat. <laughs> in Vietnam, you know, my parents uh, did well and we live in a, a nice house. You had the status in the community. Again, my dad had status in the camp. And then when you resettled, you had to fend for yourself. You were nobody amongst the masses. I think maybe that's what led my dad to um, start up the community centre. Because back then, when we came, we were one of the first sort of Vietnamese people to arrive in Hackney. There were no support, nothing. Before he started the centre, he did a degree. So he studied for a good few years, but we did cleaning. I went with him to clean offices. And then when I came home, I did my homework and straight to bed. I didn't watch any TV. So there's a big chunk of kids' culture that I missed out. So I remembered if we wanted to buy some shrimp paste or some herbs, we would go to Paris, because that is our nearest corner shop. And once I think I came back with 40 baguettes because <laughs> everyone really fancied a taste of Vietnam. And it was mostly my dad that communicated with my mum. It was through airmail. I remember it came probably once a month. Every time he got a letter, he would sit on the sofa and he would reread the letter and the letter would come out every so often and he would cry. He had one or two CDs from America, sort of famous singers who had escaped Vietnam and gone to America, and then they would sing songs about Vietnam and their experience of leaving Vietnam. It was very moving. It took five years for the paperwork and when they were finally coming over, I definitely remember the build up to it. We collected them at the airport. My brother saved me a little orange juice carton that he had on the plane. Definitely remember it quite vividly seeing them. And when they started my school, everyone had presents for them. I must admit the transition was the toughest bit because I got used to being this person in centre of attention, either with my dad or doing very well in school to having competition. <laughs> My dad had to spread his love more and I did feel that loss actually. And so it wasn't actually that smooth transition as I thought and hoped. Quite hard for them to settle. I think my brother and sister were fine, but I think my mum found it quite hard. Suddenly there were loads of rules which understandably but also just very culturally strict rules that doesn't make sense even to you as a child. Rules never make sense anyway, but saying prayer before meal or going to church every Sunday. Oh yeah, every time someone came to our house, you had to bow. And it's like, it was so extreme. It was unnecessary, you know. We had the usual conflicts like any teenage family, so that was standard. But I must admit the biggest difference is my parents, even after being here for quite a while, they still wanted both of us to marry a Vietnamese person. Even when I had you know, English boyfriends and my dad would always whisper under his breath, Vietnamese, just to remind me. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's <laughs> Thinking that he'll convert me, if, the more he says it. Now he has two English son-in-laws and they're, they're very happy. It, it doesn't matter at all now. But the interesting fact is no one ever talks about it now. Those who have made it to England, people don't really talk about their experiences. Um, they talk about, OK, we came to this camp and we got picked up by this boat. But they never, the ones that survived, never talked about their ordeal. 
To me, actually, water represents fear more than anything else. Water is it's not friendly. You know, I, I tried to swim as a child and learned to swim as a child, but I never felt um, warmth with water. Um, and depth, I've, I think I've got this thing about the depth of water as well. Um, whether I was hiding in the reeds, um, and that was that stage that I felt out of my depth. Um, but um, water is not friendly. I normally, in these images that you see in the news, I would go straight to their faces and I could, I could, you could also almost feel what they were feeling. I just feel so lucky because there were lots of other Vietnamese who had met their fate and had drowned, captured by pirates. That could have been us. Uh, just, I think it's just sheer luck um, how we survived. It is pure luck. You can't explain anything else.